Well, perhaps we should get started. I want to thank you all for coming. My name is Richard Condita Smith. I teach in the history department, and I'm the director of the Regional Oral History Office uh, here on campus. Uh, we are here for, actually, for the Regional Oral History Office. This event has very practical purposes. Uh, we are halfway through a project, a uh, five-year project, looking at the history of Kaiser Permanente since 1970. And uh, Martin Meeker, who is the uh, lead interviewer on this, has done almost all of the, almost all, but not quite all, the interviews for the project. We'll uh, present uh, some findings, some background to the project, and some uh, findings. And then we've asked uh, three uh, distinguished uh, guests to uh, speak, uh, each from their particular perspective, on things that uh, might be gleaned from the first, uh, you know, from what we have uh, already been doing. Our hope is that out of this discussion, which I would hope can be both formal and informal, uh, we can arrive at a sharpening of where where we are going uh, with our with our pursuit. Uh, the Regional Oral History Office began uh, interviewing in the history of Kaiser Permanente in the mid 1980s. Uh, when at, in 1984, Dr. Sidney Garfield, who was the founding uh, medical director, founder of the Permanente Medical Group. Um, uh, passed away. Uh, he had been interviewed briefly in a couple of different circumstances, but there had never been an in-depth uh, interview with him, nor had he ever gotten around to actually writing the memoir that he sometimes talked about writing. Uh, so uh, that generated an interest in interviewing the pioneer generation, the founding generation of Kaiser Permanente. So 22 interviews were done with individuals from that, uh, from that generation. In some ways, these were very traditional interviews. It was, uh, uh, you know, let's just tell us what happened. Uh, and these were largely people who were at the, at the top of the organization. In 2001, when I came to Berkeley and uh, became the director of the Regional Oral History Office, I began a series of conversations with people at Kaiser Permanente, a long series of conversations that involved con uh, discussions with literally dozens of people in the Bay Area, in Southern California, and in the Pacific Northwest over um, what might uh, be the next steps. There was an interest in documenting, uh, looking at what happened when the founding generation stepped aside and passed on the mantle to a succeeding generation. How was, how were Kaiser, how did Kaiser fare as it became a more normal institution? Uh, that coincided, however, that transition coincided with the passage in 1973 of the Health Maintenance Organization Act, the HMO Act, uh, which Kaiser uh, uh, Permanente people had a major influence in, in writing and in shaping, uh, but in one of those typical boomerang effects that we find very a lot in history, uh, one of the, uh, Kaiser found itself, um, the effect of the HMO Act on Kaiser was as if it had been struck by a two by four across the head. And it was the first of a series of, of crises that were going to uh, envelop the entire uh, uh, medical delivery profession in the United States due to a whole lot of, a lot of reasons. And thus, uh, it seemed like uh, the question of passing the mantle and preserving the original vision was probably not really a, going to be an adequate historical topic. And over a series of years, we came up with some research questions about um, the development of a viable economic model and the development of a, um, 
of a the Kaiser approach to healthcare. Uh, we're now in the um, perhaps in the, on the on the eve of yet another discussion of national health care. Uh, we have had many in the history of this country. It, might, it looks like it might succeed this time, though who knows? It looked like it might succeed in previous times, too. Uh, and one of the things I can't help but notice uh, when I read about what is happening in both the administration and in the White House is a continuous discussion of we're bringing all the stakeholders around the table and we're all going to make the compromises necessary. And then I thought, okay, but Kaiser Permanente is an organization that's now been in place 60 years, more or less, 60 plus years. It is an organization with a straw, with a a lot of vested uh, interests in which everyone has uh, reasons to want to make the uh, collaboration of hospital delivery, medical doctors, and insurance work as effectively as it can. Yet one of the things this project reveals is that there is a continuous set of tensions between the different stakeholders within Kaiser. So it struck me that indeed this history may be quite useful for thinking about the very process of negotiating a national health plan that uh, is based on the principle of consensus of those participating. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I want to begin the, uh, the today's discussion by introducing Martin Meeker who is, as I said, the uh, lead interviewer on this project and the person who has really shaped its historical uh, focus over the last three years. He is an academic specialist at the office. He works full time there. He's project director and interviewer for this series as well as other series. He received his doctorate in US history from the University of Southern California. He, he has taught at San Francisco State University and UC Berkeley. Uh, his essays have appeared in the Journal of the History of Sexuality and the Journal of Women's History. And his book, Contacts Desired, Gay and Lesbian Communications in Community, 1940s to 1970s, was the winner of the 2005-2006 John Boswell Prize from the American Historical Association. So, Martin, if you want to. Thank you very much to Richard Kendita Smith for those uh, gracious introductions, and thank you to the three distinguished panelists uh, for joining us today and for agreeing to take on uh, what might be considered an unorthodox assignment for a symposium of this type, as might well become uh, clear as we proceed today. And uh, finally, thanks to everyone who is assembled here today. I see a lot of uh, friends and coworkers, as well as some unfamiliar faces. Um, gathered here today on this uh, somewhat gloomy and cold Wednesday for spring for an analysis of what might well be considered a gloomy topic, and that being the healthcare system in the United States. <clears throat> so I want to begin today by setting forth a goal for this symposium, a goal that might make the panelists um, shudder, as it is likely far too ambitious for any group of scholars to accomplish in a mere few hours' time. But here it goes anyway. Um, in 1983, Basic Books published Princeton University sociologist Paul Starr's book, The Social Transformation of American Medical Care, The Rise of a Sovereign Profession and the Making of a Vast Industry. The positive critical reception of this book, it won the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction along with a host of other awards, um, was matched by the author's ambitions in this book. Over the course of two books within a single volume, the author covered the entire sweep of American history up to that point, from the colonial era through the rise of indemnity insurance and health maintenance organizations to the efforts at health care reform in the Carter years. I can think of few subfields in US, uh, few subfields of US history so dominated by a single book, and few history books that reach so far beyond history departments. Starr's book is brought up time and again by the physicians and other health plan folks I interview as it remains the standard text on the history of medicine assigned by medical schools. 
And while I believe there is certainly room for a critical reevaluation of Starr's book, um, he is a sociologist after all, I just had to get that dig in. Um, I also think that there's good reason it has stood the test of time. Um, time, however, does move onward. And as such, our reliance on a volume that is now 25 years old means that for many, the analysis of US medical history um, ends with STAR, that is around about 1982. So today, I hope to begin the process of creating a historical analysis of healthcare in the United States since the 1980s. Now, before jumping into the more contemporary period, the 1980s and especially 1990s, um, however, I think that some review is called for, especially because a number of concepts will be repeated several times today. I want to ensure that we possess at least the kernel of some shared vocabulary. Um, the first concept worth defining here is fee-for-service medicine. <clears throat> this term refers to the most conventional method of healthcare financing, which is to say that a patient is billed for the services provided by a physician or the care and accommodations provided by a hospital. This was the dominant method by which medical care was financed throughout the 19th century and for a good part of the 20th century. For those who could not afford to pay a doctor's or a hospital's bills, the options included not seeking treatment, obviously, um, maybe also working out a payment plan, which might include chickens or, you know, as well as cash, or um, seeking charity. Um, so recall that many hospitals were run by philanthropic organizations and religious orders, and most had wealthy benefactors who would donate money to help care for the poor who could not pay their own bills. The concept of medical insurance first appeared in its most basic fashion as early as the 1860s, but it was not until the, early, until the early 20th century that medical insurance was offered on a large scale. Some early examples include corporations that provided very basic coverage to its employees uh, through an on-site infirmary. Um, the more lasting development, however, came with the rise of private health insurance plans, uh, especially in the 1930s. During this decade, the rise of indemnity insurance plans, which reimbursed subscribers for at least a portion of their medical expenses, established the new norm for coverage, at least of the middle class. This decade also witnessed the creation of the so-called service benefit plans, which, according to Starr, quote, guarantee the payment for services directly to the physician or hospital, often covering the subscriber's bill in full. The most notable of these service benefit plans came with the rise of the blues. Blue Cross, for example, began as a hospital-based plan that would cover a portion of a subscriber's hospital bills for a set fee, although it was prevented by law at that point in time from covering doctor's fees, which were to be billed by and payable only to the physicians themselves. Not until much later in the 1930s, I believe it was 1939, did physicians in states such as California and Michigan begin developing a doctor-run plan, uh, which will become known as Blue Shield. Um, and then only after the American Medical Association lost an antitrust suit, uh, allowed this to develop, which would have initially prevented it from, would, they, they initially, in other words, the AMA initially wanted to prevent uh, doctors from establishing a blue shield. Once they lost an antitrust suit, then the way was cleared for them to do this, but there still remained a good deal of debate among physicians about whether this was the direction in which they wanted to move. Still, Blue Shield was closer to the indemnity model than Blue Cross, but it did provide uh, for a method by which doctors' bills would be covered in part through insurance. Now, like many other sectors of the American economy, US, US healthcare was transformed massively by World War II. With wartime wage and price controls in effect, unions emboldened by the Wagner Act and the right to collective bargaining saw the provision of health care to their members as a strong non-income gain that they could attain. Um, Paul Starr aptly labels the period immediately following from 1945 through 1959 as, quote, the rise of private Social Security when many millions of American workers became shielded from the, co the, from the real costs of health care as the cost of insurance was assumed by their employers. So we get to a point today where there's more health care in your Chevy automobile than there is steel. Um, also emerging in the 1930s as an alternative to the private 
indemnity insurance companies, and the Blues were provider organizations that best fit under the rubric of prepayment group practice. The idea behind this model was that subscribers would pay a monthly membership fee, which entitled them to receive physician, and in some cases, hospital services without being billed separately for those services. Moreover, and this is where the sticking point came with the AMA, um, doctors were to be paid a set salary and could not bill separately for services, while members of these plans were compelled to seek treatment from network doctors and hospitals only. Some of the most successful providers who used this model included, and these are early examples, the Ross Luce plan in Los Angeles, uh, which provided care for nearly 40,000 Angelinos by 1935, the group, help, the group Health Cooperative of Puget Sound, which exists today still, and eventually Kaiser Permanente. Now, despite vigorous legal and extra-legal efforts by the AMA to shut these plans down, uh, those extra-legal efforts included social ostracism, uh, a refusal to uh, admit Kaiser doctors to local medical societies, not to mention a campaign to label Kaiser and other uh, prepayment plans as, uh, you know, at least socialist uh, or at worst uh, communist. Um, uh, these plans provided viable, uh, proved viable in both the courts of law and public opinion. The number of these programs would begin to expand, especially after the 1973 passage of the HMO Act that Richard mentioned and uh, might well be discussed later on, and then ex exponentially in the 1990s with the rise of for-profit managed care organizations, which we'll get into maybe a little bit later. One alternative to these private sector health financing mechanisms, healthcare financing mechanisms, is of course national healthcare. And I'm not going to go into this too deeply today, other than to say that the failed effort by President and Hillary Clinton in 1993 and 1994 was only the most recent attempt to bring about reform on the federal level. Concerted efforts were made also by the pro progressives around 1917, New Dealers within the FDR administration, by President Truman after the Second World War, and in a more limited fashion during the administrations of President Johnson, largely resulting in Medicare, um, and then President Carter in the late 1970s. And it is with Ky Carter's effort that Paul Starr concludes his book. And thus, this is where we pick up today as we begin formulating a historical interpretation of the era. <clears throat> Again, it is my hope um, that this panel will take up my agenda beginning to craft this interpretation, at least partially through an examination of the challenges and opportunities faced by Kaiser Permanente in the 1990s, and more specifically by drawing upon a series of interviews looking at the history of this particular provider conducted under the auspices of the Regional Oral History Office, uh, which has been a research arm of the Bancroft Library since 1954. These interviews are part of an anticipated uh, five-year interview-based research project looking at several facets of Kaiser Permanente in relation to some of the most important themes in the contemporary history of American medicine. Um, and those themes are, and Richard referred to them briefly, uh, in year one we looked at evidence-based medicine, a um, whole series of interviews, uh, fairly widely ranging, but this really became uh, an interview series that, that looked, I think, at two things. One, in the most broad sense possible, uh, an examination of the impact of the information revolution uh, on medical care delivery and research in the context of Kaiser Permanente, and then more specifically about the long history of the struggle to develop electronic medical records in the context of Kaiser Permanente. There's actually a history of it in that organization going back to the 1950s and 1960s, an effort that was um, abandoned for a variety of reasons in the 1970s, but then picked up again with some um, gusto by the late 1980s and into the 1990s, resulting today in, I guess, uh, one of the more robust electronic medical records available in health systems today. Um, year two, which we've uh, recently completed, explored core values, and this is really what's uh, under examination today. I'm going to return to a, a more specific discussion about what I mean by core values and what that ended up uh, really being. Currently, we're conducting interviews on diversity and culturally competent care. Um, this is another way of saying that, um, particularly in California, since 1965, 
the demographics of the state have changed remarkably uh, with new ethnic and racial groups coming in, with new language groups coming in. How does the largest provider of health care to Californians respond to the increasing diversity of the state? Um, and so we're looking at this in three areas. One, in uh, looking at Kaiser Permanente as an employer. How do they deal with equal opportunity, for instance? Um, secondly, in uh, the practice of care. So how uh, does Kaiser, for instance, in the examining room um, deal with non-English speakers? How do they deal with, uh, for instance, people, uh, women coming from uh, an Islamic background and they have you know, show up and they have a um, male uh, gynecologist. And then finally, um, hopefully we'll be doing some interviews in the, in the context of uh, contemporary difference, ethnic and racial difference in relation to genetics and uh, medical research. Um, and then the two final years, we'll look at government relations, regulations and public policy, and finally healthcare economics. So before moving on, I should also mention uh, and emphasize something that Richard said that in addition to drawing upon these interviews and crafting their remarks, it is also my hope that the panelists um, might provide critiques of the work that we've done thus far and offer suggestions to how we might improve our research program as we enter the critical final two years. I might also add that I invite everyone here to uh, examine the project, to read the interviews. Transcripts to many of these interviews are already available online on the ROHO website, which can be just type ROHO on Google and it's like the third line down um, or through the Bancroft Library. It's easy to access these transcripts. Um, and respond to us with your own comments, questions, and suggestions. So as we delve into the 1990s, a little more background on this peculiar entity, Kaiser Permanente, or KP as I'll call it, uh, is warranted. KP possesses a founding narrative of mythical proportions. One telling places the seed of this organization in the Southern California desert in 1933, where a young physician with a fledgling practice took over a small bankrupt hospital that had been constructed to provide care for workers building the Colorado River to Los Angeles aqueduct. The hospital was failing because, quite simply, when the workers fell ill or became injured, they simply did not have the funds to pay the doctor's bills. Garfield's solution, um, and this is Sidney Garfield, uh, was deceptively simple. Ask the workers to pay a small fee out of their weekly wages, I think it worked out to five cents a day, which would guarantee treatment should they eventually need it. Moreover, with a regular predictable income, Garfield could budget for expenses in advance and count upon steady, a steady income to support himself and his small staff. A large number of workers enrolled in his program, and thus he was able to provide care for workers for the duration of the, this construction project. And he even left, I understand, with quite a good uh, profit on the, on the inside of it. Um, a key element of this initiative in prepayment comes with a widely told but possibly apocryphal anecdote, and that is discovering that the most common injury that brought workers into his hospital was caused by workers stepping on protruding nails. Garfield is said to have spent his evenings walking the worksite hammer in hand, eliminating those dangers. Now, the larger point behind this tale, maybe tall tale, is that Garfield, <clears throat> pardon me, the larger point is that Garfield learned that by practicing preventive medicine, he was able to keep workers out of his emergency room, lowering his workload, and thus keeping his hospital on stable financial footing. In later years, promoters of this model would argue that prepayment eliminates what some call the perverse incentive in healthcare delivery, whereby fee-for-service physicians get paid only when their patients are ill or in need of treatment, prepayment practices are better off financially when their members are well and thus not in the hospital using the services. The second figure in the KP story is, of course, Henry J. Kaiser, the industrialist. In 1938, an arm of Kaiser Industries started work on the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington State. Taking over from another contractor, Kaiser inherited serious labor problems, not the least of which were worker complaints about the high cost and poor quality of health care available at this remote location. Kaiser then called upon Garfield, who he had known about from his work in the desert, to tour the work site and ask him uh, to do what he had done for the workers on the aqueduct. Garfield soon agreed, 
and the lifelong partnership between Kaiser and Garfield had begun. This partnership became even closer when Kaiser contracted with Garfield and his physicians to provide health care to the newly established Kaiser shipyards in Richmond, California, just before the beginning of World War II. The Kaiser-Garfield model spread during the war, resulting in the establishment of the first Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, where it basically still stands, um, or not the same building, but the same place at least, um, as well as outposts in Vancouver, Washington, and Fontana, California. As the war was winding down, there was serious question about whether the health plan would be discontinued, but in 1944, Kaiser decided to open it up to the public at large. After the war, most of the first enrollees were union groups, including the ILWU in San Francisco. However, the relationship between Kaiser, the financier of this system, and Garfield, the leader of the medical group, was unclear, and the early 1950s represented both a period of growth for the organization and considerable debate over questions of expansion, ownership, and physician autonomy. These debates were resolved mostly in July 1955 with what has become known as the Tahoe Accords. Actually happened in Tahoe at uh, Kaiser's mansion, which later became famous in uh, Godfather II, um, just as an aside. Um, so in essence, this uh, agreement, the Tahoe Accords, was an agreement that one, established independent physician-controlled regionally headquartered medical groups uh, would be established. The Permanente Medical Group in Northern California, the Southern California Permanente Medical Group in Southern California, and so forth. Two, the, argue, the agreement called for um, the establishment of the nonprofit Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and the Kaiser Foundation Hospitals, two organizations that, for the purpose of our discussion today, we'll speak of in the singular as the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and Hospitals. They share the same board, although a different leadership. And finally, um, this agreement called for the establishment of two entities, um, or called for the establishment of these two entities, the Permanente Medical Groups and the Health Plan and Hospitals would contract exclusively with one another to provide care to the members of the program, henceforth known as Kaiser Permanente. The three decades, the three plus decades following the Tahoe Accords certainly witnessed occasional battles between the doctors and the health plan. But these years are most remarkable for the geographic expansion of the organization to Colorado, Ohio, and the Eastern Seaboard, and the sheer growth in membership of the organization from about 800,000 in 1960 to 5 million uh, by the mid-1980s, thus bringing us up to date on what is under discussion here today. Now, before I hand the podium over to our panelists, I first want to provide a short overview of some of what happened within Kaiser Permanente in the 1990s and then end by asking a series of research questions that might set us on this path I keep talking about toward the development uh, of analysis of U.S. healthcare in the 1990s. So Kaiser Permanente, <clears throat> Kaiser Permanente, pardon me, <clears throat> began the 1990s on a high point. The organization had over six million members spread across a dozen regions with operations in nearly every corner of the country. Not only was membership up, but so were revenues. And with that increasing annual surplus, um, it allowed uh, this nonprofit to expand, to invest, and importantly, to offer salaries that would attract highly qualified physicians. There was this long reputation of Kaiser as somehow being um, a lower quality healthcare provider. But coming into the 80s and 90s, um, Kaiser was really able to increase their quality simply by um, paying higher salaries and thus attracting um, better qualified uh, and better educated physicians, which in turn changed the reputation a great deal. Um, but the early 1990s also witnessed the beginning of strains that would only ultimately threaten to tear asunder the fundamental partnership forged during the Cahoe Accords of the 1950s. One early indication of this emerging discord came with the rather messy succession of CEO Jim Vose by David Lawrence as CEO of the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan and Hospitals. Now, I'm not going to go into this in detail. Uh, actually, some of the interviews do cover it in detail, so I invite you to take a look at those. Um, but the result was that by, say, 1993, CEO Lawrence was developing grand plans for change within this organization, but he attempted to make this change from a rather compromised position. Not only had the former CEO Vose continued to serve on the board and thus exert some influence, 
Um, but the medical groups were always wary of health plan CEOs, especially those who sought to realign the partnership and make broad change in some fashion. So in addition to asking Vose to resign from the board, Lawrence tried to take control of the situation by suspending the Kai Perm Committee, the Kaiser Permanente Committee, which had been the one formal forum for dialogue between the leadership of the health plan and the medical groups. And um, also, he controversially hired the McKinsey Consulting Group to advise him. Again, the details of what the McKinsey advisors recommended are in the interviews, but the important point is, what, is that they apparently advised Kai, uh, Lawrence rather, to move beyond the partnership model developed in the 1950s and instead to begin to think of and thus treat the physicians in the medical groups more as employees rather than partners. And um, I've heard a lot of folks in the health plan talk about the medical groups um, as unions or as similar to unions. And so you can kind of get a sense of uh, the management union relationship that was brewing there. Um, and anyone knows how fiercely independent physicians can be, um, how they prize their professional autonomy, uh, might see where this was headed. Still more developments included the acquisition of health plans that were later discovered to be themselves quite ill and which were vigorously opposed by some of the medical groups who later claimed that their opinions were not sought about the acquisitions in the first place. Now, in response to these challenges, the leadership of the medical groups, themselves led by um, Jay Crossan, a pediatrician um, who had started out at the Hayward facility and also a very able thinker, um, resolved to challenge Lawrence and to reassert medical group autonomy. The main development here came with the formation of the Permanente Federation in 1996 and into 1997, the first permanent legal entity binding together the regionally autonomous medical groups. For the first time, the medical groups could speak with one voice, and this voice emerged as a very powerful one. Approaching Lawrence and the health plan through the new federation, the physicians sought to reestablish the historical accord between the two halves of Kaiser Permanente, maintaining or perhaps recapturing some of their autonomy in the process. The resulting national partnership agreement was signed in early 1997 and included clauses establishing a contractual basis for mutual exclusivity between the organizations and joint decision making for such issues as geographic expansion and investment in new technologies, decision making powers that had previously been claimed solely by the health plan. The Federation, for its part, agreed to participate in something called the Care Management Institute, which provided for a mechanism for quality improvement within the medical groups. Then the crisis of 1997 and 1998 struck. Kaiser Permanente experienced negative growth, as uh, economists or as businessmen maybe like to say. Um, massive operating losses happened in those, in those two years, and this was for the first time in the organization's history that they had losses like this. And some even speculated that organization would go into receivership or split apart in some fashion. These losses were beginning to strike the entire field of managed care organizations, which had ballooned in the 1990s, with many of the new organizations, uh, unlike Kaiser Permanente, being for-profit enterprises that were traded on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and thus beholden to their stockholders. The latter half of the 1990s also witnessed a vast consumer backlash against managed care organizations, of which Kaiser Permanente, rightly or wrongly, got caught up in. Backlashes are treacherous things for historians to analyze as causes often are more imagined than real. But at the base of this backlash was the discovery of a perverse incentive within the prepayment structure. Now recall that prepayment proposed to eliminate the perverse incentive among fee-for-service physicians to make more money as their patients became um, sicker. Now the perverse motivation within the prepayment structures was discovered to be a reluctance to refer patients to specialists and outright denial of care. Thus, rather than striving to keep their patients healthy and out of the hospital, some managed care organizations to keep their profits up simply tried to keep their patients out of the hospital entirely. Now, I began conducting interviews for this second year of the project, uh, exploring the theme articulated in the proposal, largely written uh, by Richard as well as a few of his colleagues. Um, the theme, of course, was Kaiser Permanente core values, or in the words of physician leader Bruce Sams, it's genetic code, um, which included the notion of prepayment and group practice, 
of practicing preventive medicine, of integration of facilities, of physician autonomy and responsibility, um, and so forth. But I quickly learned in my interviews that asking experts to simply comment on the history and function of these values was perhaps not the most interesting approach to take. I also quickly learned that it was in the 1990s with the end of the Kai Perm Committee, the founding of the Permanente Federation, and the signing of the National Partnership Agreement that these core values were tested and examined both within the organization but also in the context, the larger context of US, U.S. healthcare through competition and crisis. So I started to conduct the interviews not only with the goal of capturing the story of continuity and change within this organization but also of exploring the degree to which Kaiser Permanente's internal narrative can help begin to establish an overall analysis of U.S. healthcare in the critical decade of the 1990s. So to that end, I want to end today by offering a series of research questions, questions that I pose to the panelists in hopes that they can draw upon their expertise and their many years of experience to move us toward that goal of historicizing this era. And these are the questions. One, many observers have suggested that there was a crisis within and backlash against managed care in the 1990s. In retrospect, was there such a backlash? Was there such a crisis? Two, if there was, what did it entail? What caused it, and what, if anything, resolved it? Three, how did this crisis impact Kaiser Permanente vis-a-vis -vis other managed care organizations, including preferred provider organizations as well as HMOs, and traditional models of delivery, such as fee-for-service physicians and indemnity and uh, in health insurance? Um, four, were, KP, were KP's internal challenges, meaning loss of revenue, declining membership and market share, and failed regions, attributable to problems within the organization, such as failed leadership, too rigid adherence to core values, or to the larger managed care crisis and backlash? Uh, five, were the innovations within KP, meaning the federation, the changes recommended by McKinsey and so forth, a response to the contextual issues or responses to specific challenges within a particular or peculiar organization. And finally, and overall, is the story of KP in the 1990s an exemplar of the healthcare challenges of that decade or something entirely different, or perhaps, as historians like to say, yes and no. Um, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Professor Robin Einhorn, who is from the History Department here on campus. Uh, she is not an expert in medical care delivery or medical history, and that is indeed why I asked her, uh, precisely why I asked her to participate. Uh, she has done, uh, uh, she has worked in public policy history and the history of American taxation. Uh, and her two books are Property Rules, Political Economy in Chicago, and American Taxation, American Slavery. She is on the editorial board of the Journal of Policy History, and she has published in that journal as well as in the Journal of Economic History. And I thought it was important for the discussion of this topic to have a historian who is knowledgeable in public policy history and how decisions are made in the United States uh, over a, a period of time, and who is uh, trying also continuously trying to deepen her knowledge over of, of this topic and enter into new periods and to think about what Kaiser, how the history, the story of Kaiser might fit into a broader history of the United States. Our next speaker uh, is Professor Alan Enthoven, who is Mariner S. Eccles, Professor of Public and Private Management Emeritus at Stanford University. He has uh, been uh, dubbed the father of managed competition, an important concept in uh, contemporary current discussions of uh, national health care. He was one of the founders of the Jackson Hole Group, a national think tank on health care policy. And his research focuses on the finance and delivery of health care in the United States and other industrialized nations and cost-benefit analysis in medical care. In his numerous publications, he has advocated a financially integrated health care delivery system that relies on market-based incentives to reduce medical costs and increase economic accountability and quality of care. Professor Enthoven is a member of the Institute of Medicine 
of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a former Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he received his BA from Stanford, a master's degree from Oxford, and his PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, all in economics. So, Professor Antelman, do you want to speak up here? Or? Fascinating, and in the last couple of days, I've spent a lot of time almost going blind reading uh, Dave and Jay's depositions or whatever we, <laughs> whatever we call it. This feels like a deposition. I didn't have to, to uh, take an oath, but um, anyhow, the reason I'm wearing a Stanford tie, it's kind of in your face, is because I, I rode up here on uh, Saturday to the Claremont with my d dear and enduring friend Jay Crossan. And Jay, for some reason I don't understand, wore a tie that was blue and gold. And the meeting was chaired by Steve Shortell, who made a big deal out of it. <laughs> and so I decided, well, by God, I just gotta <laughs> I'm just gonna let everybody know where my loyalties are. So uh, let me just pick up with your questions. Although, as background of the first question, I think, as Dave said in his um, interview, it's fair to say in the 1990s, all hell broke loose. Uh, in 1989, the average percentage increase in health insurance premiums was 18%. And, you know, people were getting ready to scream. Then the Clintons came in, and uh, that's a whole other long story, but uh, they made a mess of it. I, I mean, you know, well, I'll just say this much, that uh, the First Lady until she became a senator, seemed to think that legislation was not done by legislators, but rather it was done in the back room by the first lady and her hench persons. Um, so anyway, um, so everybody's poised. We've just got to be doing something. This can't go on much longer. And then the Clintons failed, and employers, uh, you might say, panicked. So. One of the th key things going into the decade was huge cost pressures and <coughs> the necessity to do a lot of things to rationalize the organization, that is, to make it more rational and more efficient, including squeezing out a lot of the ancient practices that were not necessarily part of the generic co genetic code but were there. Then employers wanted data. There was demand for transparency. Uh, they wanted to pay their own costs only. They didn't like community rating anymore. Uh, they were demanding, what are you doing with our money, and what are you doing to keep our workers healthy? And there were now national employers involved, and they were being more outspoken and demanding. There were employers and lawyers who were exploiting regional practice variations in Kaiser Permanente. You know, you seem to think that's the right thing to do in uh, Northern California. Well, why are you doing something different in Georgia? Can we make something out of that? And then information technology was coming over the horizon, and I think people were beginning to realize it's not going to be easy, like buying a few computers, like what they think in Washington now. It's going to be very tough because information technology means a whole transformation in the culture and the organization, how you use it, and so forth. Okay, now your questions. Many observers have suggested that there was a crisis within and backlash against managed care in the 1990s. In retrospect, was there such a crisis? To consider that, we must first distinguish very clearly between what I call delivery system HMOs or Kaiser Permanente prepaid group practice on the one hand and carrier HMOs on the other hand. You know, if you are here trying to find out where is Kaiser Permanente and what is it, what you'll find is a medical group. If you say where is uh, Pacific Air HMO, you'll go looking and the chassis will be an insurance company. Um, I do not believe that the backlash was at all aimed at Kaiser Permanente, and I'll come back in a moment to explain how I know that. Um, but it was aimed at the carrier HMOs. And the trouble came out of the fact that the employers uh, had a very, very wrong idea. They didn't accept the principle of dual choice. 
And they had the idea, they still call it the uh, single plan replacement or the single carrier replacement. The idea the, they bought it from the insurance companies was we just have one insurance carrier around here. And so then along came these insurance companies selling, quote, managed care, HMO. Employers don't understand all this stuff, but they bought this and uh, said, okay, uh, you, Mr. or Mrs. Employee, you were in free choice fees for service last month. We can't afford that anymore. So now you are in, quote, managed care. And that means you cannot go on an insured basis to your dear, friendly uh, doctor that you've loved all these years. You're going to have to go to the doctors on their list. Well, people were outraged. I understand that. If, if Stanford had tried to do that to me, I would have had a fit. Um, you know, a lot of expletives, and then you can't do that to me. If you want to do something like that, tell me how much you can afford, and then give me a choice, and I'll – and that's actually what we did at Stanford University about 1991. The, I was chairman of the Benefits Committee, and the provost uh, contacted me, and he said, Alan, our costs have doubled in the last five years. What are you going to do about it? And he's an economist and a friend, so I wrote back, it, it's the incentives, stupid. <laughs> and uh, so we changed to the model where we'll offer five or six or some number of choices. And Stanford will pay the low-priced plan, which has almost always been Kaiser Permanente, and arguably the best coordinated, best quality. And um, then employees, you look over the menu, and you pay your money, and you take your choice. Um, so. You know, as a Stanford professor, I was where I wanted to be by choice. Actually, just a historical accident, Palo Alto Clinic, I can walk to it from my office and I don't have to lose my parking place and so forth. So <laughs> we kind of got in with the Palo Alto Clinic and they're following Kaiser with Epic and so forth. Uh, and they're, they're very good also, more becoming more and more like Kaiser-like. Okay, so the backlash started with the fact that people were there without a choice. Toward the end of the decade, uh, in full repayment for my sins, the governor appointed me as chairman of the California Managed Healthcare Improvement Task Force. And it was a seething snake pit with <coughs> six doctors, five or six, I forget which is, okay, five or six doctors, five or six hospitals, five or six insurance companies, five or six employers, and five or six um, just plain members like me, and whatever that comes out to 30. Well, people were glaring across the table, and there were a lot of bad things about it, like we had the open meetings law, which meant that no two of us could ever go and talk about it. It had to all be public. You know, there this meeting, and there was Madame Lafarge with her knitting needles, you know, it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, all these angry people who were the interest groups making sure that their representative fully backed in, in an extreme form. Uh, you know, I felt the first thing we ought to do is say, time out, let's all go to a country club for two or three days and go for some walks together and have some drinks together and get to know each other and then kind of talk about what is it you really want to have to have because maybe that's something I could yield if you would yielded what I have to really have, you know, feeling your way to some, okay. But anyway, we did research, and other people did research, and what they found was that uh, the dissatisfaction with managed care was highly, highly concentrated among people who were there without a choice. Then Helen Halpin from Berkeley here did a survey, which was very valuable. We, you know, did their usual thing, interviewed a whole lot of people, and um, were they satisfied and so forth. And what came out of that was really very interesting was in all this stuff about people can't stand narrow networks. Well, it turned out, who is the most satisfied? The most satisfied insured people in California were Kaiser members. The survey just said prepaid group practice, but we all know who that is around here. So um, when I wrote to explain that, by the way, then there's a big drop to the next category, the people in carrier HMOs, and then the least satisfied were people in PPOs you know, fee-for-service, which some people were alleging, oh, that's... So that started this, this myth that the American people uh, do not like managed care. Well, it turns out 
um, they do. <laughs> if given a choice and the opportunity to keep the savings. And so this crazy thing, employers just did such dumb things. Then the insurance companies did a very foolish thing. The proposition they served up for themselves was, um, here are these doctors who are on fee-for-service and they want to do everything. And then here are these patients and they got HMO benefits, completely cost unconscious, and they want everything. And then somehow the uh, insurance company or its primary care doctors or somebody are going to be in the middle trying to be the traffic cop. That That's just a predictable that that's going to be a disaster. So um, there was a crisis of dissatisfaction about, I think, no choice. I mean, because uh, today, like 81% of University of California employees have chosen uh, an HMO or its first cousin to point a service plan. At Stanford, 81% have chosen um, uh, the, one of the three HMOs. In Cal PERS, if you take out the pat highway patrolmen who have their own plan and the prison guards who have their own plan, 81% of state full-time active employees have chosen HMOs. So don't tell me the American people were saying they don't like HMOs. What they like is choice. You know, I could tell you a whole lot more stories. And Kaiser, I think, you know, some, some of the flack, because people didn't know that they weren't a managed care plan. I mean, Jamie wrote an article about the death of managed care, and I was trying to say, no, 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 they're delivery system HMOs, and they're sailing right through this storm. Uh, so if there was, what did it entail, what caused it, and what, if anything, resolved it? Well, what it was was people furious because they didn't have a choice, because they were taken away from the doctor they knew and loved. Uh, that's what it entailed. What caused it, the foolishness of employers to treat this as a single plan replacement model rather than doing what Stanford and University of California do, which is give you multiple choices and economic responsibility. And um, what resolved it, I think, in the case of the carrier HMOs, what resolved it was uh, they backed off. Oh, well, we didn't really mean that. I mean, so they broadened their network, they relaxed the utilization controls, uh, and on and on and on. And then this fantastic, the economic history of the of the uh, decade was premium increases at, in 1989, like 18 percent, then zoom. By 1966, they were down to eight-tenths of one percent. And then uh, then all the relaxation of all these controls and zoom, it's up to, what is it, in 2002, in 2000 it was 10.9% again, going up, way ahead of unsustainable. So how did the crisis impact Kaiser Permanente vis-a-vis -vis other managed care organizations uh, and traditional models and so forth? Well, I think what it did do is kind of the J and Dave story there, which is it put them under a lot of cost pressure and competition that they had never been under before. And there was a lot of, uh, of um, uh, encrusted things that are not the genetic code, but like the, from the Tahoe Agreement, this deeply ingrained culture that, by God, we're the doctors and nobody's going to tell us how to practice medicine, and there's kind of regional autonomy, then the, the uh, regional manager had to kind of buy into that. And so extreme regional autonomy. A lot of what had to happen was um, standardizing across the program, like Care Management Institute, because it doesn't, it's not a good idea if you're defending a malpractice suit here, and this is the way you say to practice medicine, and over there it's something different. And not only that, but they had every region was its own guidelines factory. And guidelines is a very costly business. And so the idea of Care Management Institute is both we will build some forces where the doctors themselves will work out guidelines and feed them back to themselves, can communicate through the electronic system, but also they won't be running all these little guidelines factories. We'll have an organized Care Management Institute and in a process in which we, because it's over the whole system, we can, we can afford to, to uh, um, you know, put the resources into it. And I think in, in other important things that they, um, you know, they kind of nationalized, if you like, the, um, I even made a list of it someplace. Yeah, guidelines, purchasing, you know, that's a, a big problem because the 
orthopods here want this joint replacement, and the orthopods there have their friendly relationships with, with their doctors, except their manufacturers, except to the credit of all the Permanente doctors, they have taken an oath of absolutely no conflict of interest. That is, they don't allow themselves any, so they can't have friendly relationships with any manufacturer. Uh, then IT was coming. Well, it just makes so much sense to say, again, we can't afford to invent and develop 12 different IT systems. We've really got to have a single unified budget. Oh, well, you're mm -hmm. taking some authority away from us. No, sorry, but it doesn't make sense. Labor relations, you need to kind of do that. Personnel development, because that's, that's costly. Insurance, financial services, advertising, national media. So just a lot of that needed to uh, impinge on, on uh, the regional autonomy. And the Permanente Federation, especially headed by Jay, was a great way to do that because it gave the doctors the vehicle for taking charge of a lot of these things. Then the guidelines development became their uh, their activity. And the IT, certainly the doctors have to play a leading role. If the, if the doctors don't love it, then it's not going to work, et cetera. In, let's see, were the internal challenges, loss of revenue, declining membership, market share, attributable problems within the organization, failed leadership, rigid adherence, or the, it was, I think, a lot of the internal challenges came from the fact these challenges I talked about, cost, national scrutiny, demand for transparency, so forth, that they just had to respond in the ways that they did, and they were, they were good responses. Um, I think when you say failed leadership and so forth, well, you know, in some of the smaller regions, uh, the, the performance wasn't terrific. There was a lot of learning lessons there. Uh, were the innovations within KP, the Federation, changes? I'm not sure exactly what McKinsey recommended, but I think the changes I described were driven by the context, but they managed to keep the core values uh, in place. Um, where does that put me? Jefferson, <laughs> Hamilton. Jefferson, you're Jefferson. You're <laughs> you and me. You and me. Um, I mean, I it's still got group practice, integration of facilities. These all have powerful economic prepayment, preventive medicine, voluntary enrollment, physician responsibility. I've always said for one of these, a program to succeed, you have to win the loyalty, commitment, and responsibility of the doctors. And the, man the carrier HMOs failed because the doctors hated it. You know, but Kaiser Permanente succeeded because the docs feel they are in charge and they love what they're doing. So, let's see. Um, so well, so you had this beginning good idea, but some crusty barnacles that had to be taken off. So overall, is the story of KP an exemplar of the healthcare challenges of that decade? Yes, and the ability of KP to um, to respond to it. And just kind of looking forward, Jamie and I are very much involved with the Integrated Healthcare Association, and uh, we have carrier HMOs based on multi-specialty group practices competing with Kaiser. And I think uh, one of the big weaknesses of the carrier HMOs is they are just not able to align incentives. All the people on the team just can't get rewarded and pointed in for going in the right direction like you take Pacific Care in the Palo Alto Clinic. Pacific Care wants to have a lower capitation rate from Palo Alto. And they say, why should we do that? We want more money, and you want us to give us less money. So there's a, you know, and, and on and on through the whole thing. So there's just a lot of incentive misalignment. And one of the things I think about the, the genetic code, particularly the idea that the whole program drinks from the same fire hose, that is the money comes in from satisfied members who have a choice, and now, the hospitals and the doctors look at it and say, well, what's the best way to spend it to keep the members happy and re rejoining us and so forth. So maybe that's looking on to the uh, economics in the future, but I think that's proving to be a very important advantage. I don't think the carrier HMOs are going to be able, unfortunately, I'd love to see stronger competition, but I don't think the carrier HMOs are going to be able to uh, really effectively uh, compete with Kaiser over the long run. End of story. You were very patient, Jamie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
I should point out that uh, part of this pro this project so far has done. There have been 41 interviews conducted for this project, about 165 hours of material, and we're about halfway through. And at 100 to 200 pages per interview, we couldn't very well ask the panelists to uh, it really explore the full range of it. So we suggested the Crossan and the Lawrence as represent as uh, particularly important for thinking about the choices Kaiser made. But uh, but there is that's just the tip of the iceberg, and uh, most of the interviews are many. Most of the interviews are online, readily available. Maybe I just ought to quickly add one thing. The audience may wonder how do I relate to this anyway. Well, uh, back in late '60s, early '70s, I was on the board of directors of Georgetown University and on the medical center committee, and we looked at the problem of the future of me American medicine. Where has it got to go? costs, all this stuff, and uh, prepaid group practice looks like the right model. And so the um, community medicine department created Georgetown University Community Health Plan, and I was the board member that introduced the board and explained why this is such a good idea so around 1970. So then we created uh, Georgetown University Community Health Plan. Uh, Ten years later, they'd done a great job of growing their membership, but they had a kind of academic governance. So I remember when the marketing director uh, decided to stay home and be a mother, I, you know, in their search and everything else, I was thinking, gee, you know, if this was part of Kaiser, Kaiser would just go down the list, well, who's the deputy marketing director in the next region who's due for a point promotion? Okay, then I came to Stanford in 1973, and knowing I was going to be geographically close to Kaiser, I went over and introduced myself and said, you know, I really believe in what you're doing. I'd like to be a part of it. And I remember Jim Vose, later the CEO, but still a very good friend, said, well, we've come this far without a consultant, but what the hell, let's give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> and that was whatever it is, you know, so years later. And then in 1980, I had the duty of going back and telling Georgetown Community Health Plan, it's time for you to throw yourselves into the hands of Kaiser Permanente because they couldn't pay their bills. They just weren't financially managed well enough. So I became a, a consultant to Kaiser Permanente, and I've interacted with them uh, over the years. Now I'm related to them through the Institute for Health Policy. Um, had managed competition and all this other stuff kind of grew. I, there's a big political story, Dr. Einhorn, that is Kaiser Permanente changing the world. I mean. There would be no idea of managed competition and all the rest of it if it wasn't for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, th there's no credibility to the story of uh, competition unless you can point. See, there's some people who do a better job for less cost. And uh, in uh, 1976, the Carter administration wanted me to come back and be a assistant secretary. Jimmy Carter had promised, I'll give y'all universal, mandatory, compulsory, comprehensive health insurance with absolutely zero idea, zero idea of how to do that. So Joe Califano, my old friend from Johnson administration days, called me up and said, Alan, you come back and help us figure it out. So I said, well, I will be a consultant to you. So for a year or so, I invented what I called Consumer Choice Health Plan. And the idea was let's make the whole world look like from a health insurance point of view, it looked like the University of California. Got a bunch of different choices, pay the low price plan or some fixed dollar amount below or at that, and then let people take their choices. And what I was seeing is this is a model in which prepaid group practices, including my friends at Kaiser, would be able to grow and succeed. I was trying to create a model of what is the environment that is best for high quality, cost effective, healthcare delivery organizations that satisfy their members. And uh, so if this, if this all ever comes to pass, I think Kaiser will have had a big impact on that. Their success has given credibility. I mean, now in Washington, there's all this stuff about, oh, we've got to get greater integration, we've got to more prevention, you know, all these things they describe, and it's more and more like, we, we, you know, if the Congress was smart enough to do it, would be hand over Medicare to Kaiser and let them do it. <laughs> So I think there is an interesting political story. You know, it involves Elwood, the HMO Act, and so forth. But that's that's for another day. 
Okay, our final speaker today is Professor James Robinson, who is the Kaiser Permanente Distinguished Professor of Health, e Health Economics at the School of Public Health here at UC Berkeley. Uh, he is a contributing editor to Health Affairs and a member of the and ex on the a member of the executive board of the Integrated Health Association. Uh, like uh, Professor Antoven, he ha he is an economist. He has a PhD in economics uh, from UC uh, Berkeley, uh, as well as a uh, public health degree from University of California, Berkeley. And he has been one of the leading uh, investigators in the field of healthcare financing models. So uh, with, with his remarks, we will conclude the panel se uh, session and then go into questions and discussion. Thank you. Well, I'm certainly pleased to be here, particularly um, with my friend Alan, and to meet the rest of you for the first time. And um, this is a, a great session. Um, but of course, in, as in all these things, there's a little bit of a tendency to this to to, to turn into sort of a, a self-congratulatory love fest about how Kaiser is the greatest thing in the world. And um, so, if I had a prepared remarks, which I don't. I would be like the successes and failures of Kaiser Permanente, and I get to talk like this because my own credentials as Kaiser Booster are absolutely unimpeachable. <laughs> uh, I have written dozens of articles in a book right, about prepaid group practice. I hang out with Alan Enthoven. Uh, my kids were born down here on MacArthur Boulevard at the Kaiser on the sixth floor of Kaiser uh, Hospital, and et cetera. Um, so, now, um, I'm going to just say just briefly my, just a general overview, and then I think I'll ref um, comment on a few of the questions that Martin had. Um, the successes of Kaiser, well, the most obvious ones are that it's got built a viable, strong organization that is uh, the single largest private health delivery system in the United States, very dominant. Uh, in California, it's about a 35% market share right here in the um, East Bay, 50% market share in Solano County. Uh, Solano County has Kaiser and Medicaid. That's what it's got. Um, and that it's been, um, so it's uh, in its core areas. And as, as Alan um, very uh, eloquently pointed out, it's been a, a model. It is a model for a certain uh, structural uh, features that um, have taken on in the delivery system as a whole, uh, um, care coordination, care management uh, care co uh, more broadly, uh, electronic health records, and focus on prevention in the benefit package, and a variety of other things, all of which uh, are great and enduring. Um, if I were to say what are the, the not the failures so much, but the, the, the limitations of Kaiser, I would say that um, what's striking about Kaiser, and this is unfortunate, is that it has not been able to understand its own genetic code and therefore reproduce itself outside of a, a number of core areas, most of which happened when there was essentially no good competition back in the 70s. The expansion areas that have been successful all started in the 70s, with the exception of one or two. Um, and of equally serious or more serious that it that no one else understands its DNA and has not been able to re reproduce it either. And I think that the, the I mean Kaiser has always been an evangelical organization as well as a business organization, and the fact that the that the United States is not full of Kaiser Permanente type organizations today is um, unfortunate. I think it's unfortunate. Uh, Kaiser thinks it's unfortunate. Um, and I think that from a scientific perspective, as you say, well, why? And there's actually no good explanations for that. I've, I have um, reflected on that topic, which does not earn me any points in um, Kaiser and elsewhere. Of, um, but I could comment on that. But I just think that just the very, f the raw facts of the situation is there are fewer prepaid group practices and vertically integrated um, physician hospital insurance systems today than at every, any time in the past 30 years of America, and, the, and they're, de they're, they're shrinking, they're declining. This is a model. Kaiser itself is a, con is a wonderful success. The, the model, though, is disappearing. 
it's virtually disappearing. And this is a and and this is a sobering thing from a for obviously from a healthcare perspective, from a health policy perspective, and from an analytic perspective. And I think that these oral histories, I'm not a historian, and, and um, I think these oral histories are, are, are interesting. I've actually done some interviews. We, we at Health Affairs do interviews with lo leading lights. And so I go through the process of interviewing people. And it's hard to get people to talk. And so I, you know, I think this is good. You know, you guys get these guys to, to really say a lot of good stuff. And, but I would say from a scientific perspective to, if you really want to understand the history of Kaiser Permanente, you better go out there and interview some non-Kaiser people. How about some competitors? Um, the competitors that I would say are like, let's say, eating Kaiser's lunch out there. Okay? I mean, there's a lot of really rough competitors that have been really successful out there. And, and why? Is it for the wrong reasons, for the right reasons? I'm totally with Alan. I think part of it is, is due to stupidity. It's stupidity among the employers. It's stupidity among the physicians. It's stupidity in Congress. It's stupidity in the White House that's led to a lot of our problems uh, today and in the past. But still, there's deeper economic issues going on there, too. One thing I would like to highlight on this is that we, there's a lot of talk right now about health care reform. It's coming up again. Obama plan, uh, congressional Democrats. And I think that there's two really st the striking features of health care reform in its big things, not in the small things. Everybody believes in care management. Everybody believes in electronic health records. But the, the biggest aspects financially of what's going on among the congressional Democrats is a serious threat to the Kaiser model. First of all, the very first thing that they're going to do is take a big bite out of Medicare Advantage payments. Kaiser Permanente is a major Medicare Advantage contractor, you take 15% out of their PMPM revenues on their, all their senior populations, that's a problem. That is a very serious problem. And that's going to be done on the assumption that these are overpayment, unjustified use of taxpayer dollars. Okay? Not because Kaiser Permanente, they're in their heads, they're thinking Humana in North Dakota. They're thinking, you know, well care in Florida. That's what they're thinking about. But the money does also go to Kaiser Permanente right here. The second thing is, is the, the big striking feature of the Obama uh, discourse has been the so-called public plan option. Right? That, uh, that it's not um, that we just want to have Americans have insurance, that we think that Americans, that we don't, I don't, but President Obama does and his advisors do, think that Americans below the age of 65 need a choice of a public plan that looks like Medicare fee-for-service indemnity. The Obama plan is Medicare fee-for-service indemnity for the under 65. Its, its virtues are that it does price controls. It does not do coordinated care. It does not do electronic medical records. It does not do physician hospital coordination. It does not rely on any form of prepayment or group practice or anything. So here we have a Democratic president and Congress who is turning their back on everything that Kaiser Permanente stands for. Now that just shows that they're getting all this advice, Obama's advice is getting from all these Harvard Medical School affiliated economists and doctors, who, that's their worldview. Okay? And they're benighted because they, you know, they don't spend their time out here. So you can't be in California studying healthcare without being kind of like, Kaiser's like everywhere. You kind of got, you can't develop a theory of the healthcare market that doesn't take into consideration Kaiser as a big success, and then then the concepts of like group practice and prepayment. It just like kind of like Alan, just, it just sounds. To, when you listen to it after a while, you kind of go, "This sounds like really reasonable." You know, it sounds like a, you know, it sounds like a really reasonable thing. But if you go outside of California, this kind of like mm, what? You know, doctor is you know Dr. Jones down on the corner. And then Mercy Hospital is over here, run by the Catholics, and, and the insurance company is, uh, you know, I can't even, what's the difference between Blue Cross and Aetna anyway? You know, who, you know, really, who cares? Blue Cross, Aetna, Medicare, whatever, they're all the same, which kind of they are. So um, anyway, that's my, um, my, my sort of overview, and that's, I would say, that's the, for those of us that really, uh, that are not historians, but want to understand the dynamics of uh, markets in competition in, in healthcare, um, the 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 Kaiser model. Kaiser itself has been a big success. The Kaiser model has not been a big success, and that's partly for the stupidities that Alan was talking about: employer stupidity and Hillary Clinton stupidity and stuff like that. 
uh, which we can all tear our hair out about. Um, but I think that, that you know, there's other issues to it. So let me talk uh, just very briefly about this. Um, was there such a crisis against managed care in the 1990s? Yes, uh, Alan was certainly part of it. It's probably about choice. But other things were going on. Not only, for example, in the 90s was Kaiser Permanente almost go broke. And just for the record, it's just generally perceived by the outsiders, and you can check this or not, that, that uh, David Lawrence, under his leadership, Kaiser Permanente almost went bankrupt. Okay, let's just say it. All right. Now, Kaiser almost went down. A lot of the other medical groups in California did go down. Okay, there was a wave of bankruptcies and of shrinkages of prepaid group practices throughout California and the rest of the country. Okay, very big names. I'm talking about medical groups uh, that had hundreds of thousands of affiliated patients. I'm not, none of them were as big as Kaiser, but um, that they're simply gone today. And they were both, some of them were relatively new and some of them were relatively old. Um, and those that remain, some of them remain attached to prepayment, others don't. Many medical groups that survive do not do prepayment anymore. In California, prepayment is still strong for various reasons, although, like they say, the Scripps Clinic, which is one of the leading multi-specialty groups, does not take capitation anymore. Outside of California, you look at the, at the multi-specialty leading groups, the Mayos, the, you know, the, the, the Park Nicolettes, the, the, um, uh, all, those, all the clinics, which are very wonderful. They mostly, they're fee-for-service. Uh, they're paid on a fee-for-service basis by, and they rely on Aetna and on Blue Cross and WellPoint, and that's who they deal with. And so I think that an understanding of the problems of Kaiser in the 90s would have to be in the context of the problems of, of all these other entities which were wannabe Kaisers. You've got to remember that, I mean, I used to do a lot of consulting, a lot of work with these entities as well as with Kaiser, but Pacific Care wanted to be Kaiser. They wanted it to be, but they didn't have a permanente. So there was a bunch of incipient, and as did HealthNet, and there was a bunch of incipient permanentes. And so they thought, well, we'll just have a diverse set of permanentes, and they'll be called Healthcare Partners Medical Group and the Scripps Clinic and the, the Bay Valley Medical Group and the Hill Physicians IPA and Brown and Toland. And we'll kind of stitch them together, and it'll be kind of like virtual integration, and we'll, you know, we'll go to market like that. And, but the idea was we were all going to get more and more integrated over time, and as Alan pointed out, they didn't. There, there was conflict. There's a long story. But the, all these, if all these Kaiser wannabes, and they were really serious about it, uh, if, they, if they all blew up, we, we kind of want to know why. And that's part of the Kaiser story. It is part of the Kaiser story. Because it's not the Kaiser story so much. It's the story of prepaid group practice. Okay? So I think it's, um, if I were a historian, it, the story hasn't been written. It's wide open for all you historians, um, and, but it's, um, it's, you know, you can't write a history of the Catholic Church just interviewing cardinals. That's what, that's, I guess, what I would say. <laughs> uh, um, all right. Um, in terms of, um, uh, it's, how did the crisis impact Kaiser vis-a-vis -vis other managed care organizations? Kaiser, um, I would say Kaiser's both an insurance company and a delivery system. The delivery system is winning. The insurance company is losing in its relative field. Um, uh, the best example around here, you know, Kaiser hires 75 percent of all primary care graduates out of every medical school in the state of California. You can't get a primary care appointment easily if you're not a Kaiser member. Kaiser, you get it the same day. Okay? Average age of the medical staff at Alta Bates Hospital, which is about a mile from here, is 56. Okay, you can't get doctors to move into ca into the Berkeley area with the price of housing for what doctors earn these days, unless they're orthopedic surgeons. Okay, that's the only group that'll move into town. Um, whereas Kaiser, they've got it. They've got, and so and they've got their hospitals. They've invested in the IT. They're rebuilding the facilities. They've got the medical staff. They're winning. Okay, the insurance though is is not winning. They don't have the model. They don't have the products. Uh, the people that are winning in that market, it's WellPoint. It's United Healthcare, um, and then there's a few uh, others, and it's a very serious issue. And that tension as you, uh, about the issue, the relationship between the health plan and the delivery system, it remains. It's particularly acute outside of California and Kaiser regions where they don't have such a dominant. Um, sure. 
so I think that the the evolution of the managed care, of the insurance companies uh, to be diversified, multi-product organizations. It's a little bit, you might say, that this is an unfair analogy, but that Kaiser was kind of like Henry Ford. Henry Ford, any, you, can, you can buy any car you want so long as it's a Model T and it's black. And he just built the cheapest, best car on River Rouge and brought the automobile from being something that was a luxury good to something that the middle class could afford. General Motors came in and said, no, we've got a different car for every price uh, and, every, and every preference in every pocketbook, I believe was the thing. And so they had the whole uh, line and um, they um, uh, eventually got a larger market share. Um, and in some sense, the other health plans are like that. They've, you know, if you go look at a WellPoint, a Blue Cross, Anthem Blue Cross, or a, you know, pick any of them, they've got their um, a prepaid HMO product uh, that they deal with in the Palo Alto Clinic. They've got their individual fee-for-service HMO product. They've got their PPO products with all different kinds of deductibles. They've got their consumer-directed health plan uh, product. They'll experiment with anything. United Healthcare just bought a staff model HMO in Las Vegas, and they're, they're not divesting it. They're saying, well, maybe we can make this vertically integrated thing work, you know? They'll try anything, and um, they, they, you know what I mean? And, and it's, so it's... Um, you know, and their their you know their mission, their strategic values is to you know to uh, still be in the yellow pages next year. I mean, that's kind of like that's what you know. It's like whatever, uh, whatever works. Um, I admire Kaiser in having um, uh, affiliation to to its core values. And look, which car company needed the federal bailout? Which yeah, didn't. both of them. Both no, of them. Ford. I know, but still, <laughs> would you buy a Ford? I mean, does anybody in this ha in this room own an American built? I mean, American you know, car. Um, okay, um, were Kaiser's internal challenges attributed to problems within the organization, or the larger managed care crisis? C economists have to answer that in one way: that the, the environment dominates the internal m most of the time. Okay, particularly when everybody else was having the similar problems. All the other prepaid group practices, uh, you know, Harvard Community Health Plan, um, HIP in New York, they all have gone through big changes from that original model. It's not just Kaiser. And were the innovations within KP a response to contextual issues or responses to, well, both, I would say. And is the story of KP in the 90s an exemplar of healthcare challenges or something entirely different? Well, I guess I would have to say, it's, I don't know what exemplar means, but it, w the st it, it was caught up. Kaiser was a very big entity, but it was caught up as in, a, in a tsunami of change. And it, it survived, which is a great tribute to the core values of the organization. Um, and just the inertia and, and, and the chaos around it. Its competitors went bankrupt before it did. It was, you know, it was partly what it was. Then they started just relentlessly raising prices. Kaiser Permanente and the others have survived by raising prices to the, cons to the employers and the consumers. And that, that, that's just, and, and you know what I mean? Those, those costs have just gone up and it's good. It saved the organization, um, and which is great. And, um, so I think that, uh, you know, I, I guess we just want to just be um, uh, even-handed. I think that the core values and internal stuff is very important. And I'd like to say that uh, many of us, including me, uh, were, um, were skeptical. At the time, back a decade ago, it wasn't clear that uh, mutual exclusivity was the right way to go. It seemed like that this more virtual integration with multiple um, uh, uh, medical groups and, and multiple health plans, where there wasn't a kind of a labor union, uh, you know, trench warfare kind of thing going on, was more adaptable, more flexible. A lot of these medical groups were trying new different things. Health plans were trying new different things. They were into different niches. They were into Medicaid. They did all kinds of stuff. It seemed like it was a more flexible thing, whereas the Kaiser seemed like it was sort of a little bit rigid. And it turned out, in retrospect, that um, um, the Kaiser was right, that sticking with the core was right, and, and doing all this experimentation, they, they were lucky they didn't do too much of it. And so they, they, they I believe, they um, survived the turmoil of the 90s because of their values. And that makes me a Jeffersonian. <laughs> We have um, about 15 or 20 minutes for questions, uh, comments, discussion. Uh, it would be very helpful to us at the Regional Oral History Office if you have any suggestions or 
Yes, Sally. Um, it's probably a simple question, but I'm confused about how this talk about genetic codes and core values and the fact that you know the Kaiser model is not a template for other organizations. So my simple question is, what is permanent about Kaiser Permanente and what is transferable and what is not? And has that changed over the years? Um, and also, what component is there for any of this? I hear a lot about econ e you know, economics. Where does ideology fit in? And is that the same thing as, or is that a component of core values and genetic codes and all that stuff? When you, you take ideology, you mean in the sense of left, right, Democrats, Republicans? Well, it, it seems to me that there's an inherent conflict in the way that Kaiser is set up, where you've got the, you know, you've got the business people over here and you've got the docs over there. And they're in it for slightly different reasons, or at least they like to think they are. So is there some um, sort of core something or other that is pulling this organization together and making it work over these 60 years? Well, uh, the ideology, let me just dispense with that. You know, there were, there were times when they were considered socialized medicine, and the Democrats loved them because labor loved them and so forth. And then the Republicans came in, and they began to love them because they were seen as uh, something, I, actually, I believe, the last tenable bastion of private enterprise in American medicine because it's responsible and improving and so forth. But as to what holds it together, well, I think on the management side, we get very good people who like to be in a nonprofit community service organization and, you know, feel good about what they're doing. Some of my students have gone to work for them. Um, and the docs, because they see this as a framework in which they can practice better and better and better medicine with the um, uh, electronic record and all that. Like one of my former students has been chief of orthopedics around here now. And he's, I've been working with him some on writing this. And um, in 2000, orthopedic surgeons in the whole of Kaiser created a registry uh, where they all agree to report in exactly the same way and build this database and then track what happens to the patients. That is something that practically never happens in American medicine. You know, the docs really do, it's a dirty little secret of American medicine. They don't know what happened to their patients. I had a heavy duty operation at Stanford Hospital about 11 years ago, and the doctor was talking as if he had a database, which he didn't. And I thought, you know, pretty soon I'm going to be in a registry, and every so often I get an email, how are you doing, or something. None of it. The only thing was Stanford Hospital wrote to me and said, how did you like the food? <laughs> but. With this registry, you know, I've, I've seen them do it. They, they do statistical analyses and they're watching. Oh, and we, you know, we introduced that product. Well, how is that doing compared to other ones? There was a time when the orthopods didn't agree about with the shaft that goes into your tibia for a knee replacement, do you glue it or you don't glue it? So they said, well, docs, make up your own mind. Just one thing, you got to report it accurately in the record. And then they tracked it and they found five years later that uh, a glued survived 98% of the time, unglued survived 95%, you know, so glue, glued was better. So word went back to all the docs, you know, there's this problem with glued and it feed, and that's something American medicine doesn't have. So I think these doctors are, you know, enthusiastic about that, that, um, so, so there's a shared enthusiasm by the managers and the, and be believing this is a good model. Anne? I just have this burning question I've been thinking about ever since I started giving you talk. Why don't you go to Kaiser? Oh, it's mainly geography. Parking, it's parking. <laughs> <laughs> it's par well, it's, I mean, of our six children, four have been Kaiser members, some with my encouragement. Two of them, one is in Hong Kong, one is in Raleigh. The one in Raleigh, Kaiser used to be there, and whenever I go to see her, She's in mourning because she and her husband left, and she said, oh, it's terrible, my two little girls have to have uncoordinated medical care and you know, so forth. But the other two that are still in Kaiser love it. You know, I get hear from my daughters-in-law all these good stories. In fact, one of my daughters-in-law is a third-generation Kaiser member, so now together with my son, they're producing fourth-generation Kaiser members. <laughs> but um, we live fairly close to Palo Alto, and I work, I can I just about see 
from the window of my office, I can see the Palo Alto Clinic, it's right over there. And kind of, we got into this um, there, and just the, the great convenience of it, I'd go buy it on my way to work, my wife on her way to shopping and everything, it's just very convenient, whereas if we were to go to Kaiser Redwood City, it would be a 15 minute drive, or to Mountain View, it would be a 10 or 15 minute drive, have to get a parking, you know, one thing for me is, I can go to Palo Alto without giving up my parking place. <laughs> uh, but I don't think that my longevity prospects are any better with Palo Alto than with Kaiser. I think they're uh, you know, similar. Kaiser is probably stronger on, on prevention. Could you be that the prospects for the Kaiser model success would be better now than they were? A decade or two decades ago, just because of the the culture of our society in itself, we have spent a good part of the 20th century trying to define. First of all, do we want to have a health, a national health care? And it seems now that there is every decade that goes by, the consensus becomes stronger and stronger that we are moving in that direction. And maybe it's just the time wasn't right for Kaiser 10, 20 years ago. Well, I think it all depends on what kind of national health insurance model we go for. If we go for the one that I've been proposing for 30 years now, it's like what the University of California has for its employees. It would be writ large across America. The government would say, we're going to run these um, exchanges, you know, a shopping mall where you can come in. Well, use, I'll use the Dutch. I have disciples in Holland. And uh, they've gone national now as a managed competition plan. Uh, their only problem is they don't have a Kaiser, but they're over here studying Kaiser now. <laughs> but anyway, so you get a fixed dollar contribution which enables you to buy your way in. We organize a market with rules like guaranteed issue, community rating, standard benefit package, and stuff like that. And you go to the website and you click the one that you want. And the rules are they have to take you. Another thing they have in Holland and they should have here is another idea made in America is risk equalization. A great big uh, behind the scenes program so that the uh, insurer that enrolls more diabetics gets appropriate paid more for that. So that kind of a model, uh, Kaiser would do just as it has done for state employees in this state, or the HMOs have done actually and state employees, they've got Blue Shield HMO, and they're competing. Uh, so if you take out the highway patrolmen and the prison guards who have their own plan, then 81% of the state employees have chosen Kaiser or Blue Shield HMO. I guess what I'm so, asking is... So what I'm saying is we just got the market set properly, you know, so that the most efficient economical health plan wins, they would have a field day. So it's, you know... Why have we? Why has Kaiser been so unsuccessful? I was in Connecticut as a Kaiser member when they dropped out. Of yeah. Well, I was a Cali okay. I've been a fourth, fourth generation California Kaiser. Why can't this model be duplicated elsewhere? Why hasn't it been? Well, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Is it well, regional? Is it? No, no. It I feel I feel very sure it's not it's not regional because Harvard Community Health Plan, a prepaid group nonprofit prepaid group practice started up in. Uh, Boston around 1970, about the same time as Georgetown University Community Health Plan. And um, I think the big problem, the number one overwhelming problem in all of this is employer-based health insurance because, for the most part, employers do not offer choices. They don't do what the state employees or Stanford or the University of California do. Kaiser and their HMO competitors do extremely well in that market. And it's not just in uh, California, in Wisconsin where they have a state employee's health insurance model that looks just like what I'm describing. 94% of the state employees have chosen uh, group practice HMOs. And they're not exactly Kaiser, but let's say the Dean Clinic or the Marshfield Clinic, they have a multi-specialty group practice and they have their own insurance product. And so and I, I'm back there working with them on a reform plan and the Dean Clinic, was, which is highly regarded, and it's in Madison, and a huge number of legislators and professors belong to that. It's not too far from Kaiser, and if they, if they uh, 
had this level playing field and, and competition, they would find there are already group practice. There are a bunch of multi-specialty group practices around the country. Uh, the, well, they I'm going to take a different, little different approach yeah, okay. to this same question. Um, because, I mean, I certainly agree that multiple choice is a good thing and that it drives efficiency. I don't think that I don't, I've never seen any, any any data that suggests that there's more multiple choice employer structures in the state of California on a per capita basis than there is in other parts of the country. Harvard University, for example, has offers the same menu of, of, of choices to the employees, and the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program nationally offers a variety of choices. And yet, you know, and back to Boston, the Harvard Community Health Plan split apart. It blew up, right? I mean, the, the medical group went one way. And the insurance company went a different way, and they never have any hospitals, and uh, et cetera. So I think that um, uh, the, the 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 choice framework that Alan has always been in favor of, and that, that Obama is in favor of, and I certainly am in favor of, uh, which was to be give people a choice, but if they want to buy the more expensive, they pay up with their own money. <clears throat> that I think is a good thing. It would lead to efficiency in the healthcare system, and it would be a great thing. However, would that mean that we therefore have more prepaid group practices? That is a non sequitur. That's a, that's, you have to prove that s separately. Um, and I think it proves that the, what's, really, what's really remarkable about California is it's, about, it's something about Kaiser. Because the same lot of market environment um, is, exists in other areas. You still have multiple choice in some areas. And yet you don't have Kaisers or want to be Kaisers or Kaiser localized. You have a few here and there. There's bits and pieces. In the no in the upper Midwest, you have the Mayo Clinic tradition. You cannot ex explain the the, the 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 medical group model in the in the Dakotas and in Minnesota and in Wisconsin without understanding that they all were descended from the Mayo brothers. And that that's why they're there, that's why they're still and the Mayo brothers did not accept capitation. They were not a primary care-based medical group, and those entities are not capitation-oriented medical primary care-focused medical groups. They took on some of that in the 90s when it seemed, but um, they're different. They're culturally very different from the prepaid group practice model. That's another thing the historian should write. There's two traditions in medical groups in, in, the, in the United States. There's the Mayo tradition. And there's the permanente tradition, and they're really different. And they, and to some extent, they get along. To some extent, they don't. The American Medical Group Association blew up as all of the the the, the primary care oriented, capitated, prepaid practices pulled out, and leaving the fee for service Mayo type entities. Now Kaiser has played both sides of that because it's Kaiser, and it, you know. But there's two different traditions. There's the multi-specialty fee-for-service group practice tradition, of which Mayo is the founder. And there is the primary care-based prepaid tradition, of which Permanente, and then after Permanente comes the whole gamut. There are 250 medical groups in the state of California that are paid on a capitated basis. They come from the Kaiser tradition, with a few exceptions, such as Palo Alto Clinic and the Scripps Clinic and the Woodland Clinic, which are all Mayo progeny. <laughs> We have, we have okay. a question over here. Uh, yes, I, um, I'm curious. This has come up a few times with uh, people talking about being third generation or fourth generation Kaiser, and this it strikes me. And, and I actually I, I uh, do research at Kaiser and talk to Medicare beneficiaries about the Kaiser benefits. And a lot of them will say, "Well, I chose Kaiser because I've been I'm third generation Kaiser or I'm second second generation Kaiser." Um, whereas I've had probably, you know, since graduating, since I've been old enough to have my own insurance, I have five different insurance plans and it doesn't really matter to me. So um, what is, what, how is this loyalty, um, is there any, any explanation for this loyalty and how, how does it sort of affect the story of Kaiser maybe weathering the storm and, and, and where, where, where is that headed? It's loyalty to the delivery system, not to the insurance company. See, people, that's the thing. People are a little bit confused about, you know what I mean, or that issue. It's very important, but it's still, um, people are, feel, is that, you accept that, right? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Is, it, is it possible uh, to differentiate know, there when we talk about I've been, consumers? They think of it as a single entity, don't they not? Yeah. yeah, but I mean, it's just like they, they, some some people are very affiliated with the Palo Alto Clinic. They feel just as intensely about it as, the, as other people do about yeah. Kaiser. But if they have to go through it through Blue Shield or Pacific Care, you know, whatever, they... they, they yeah, they, I've they, gotten there with four different insurance companies. And I'm indifferent to the insurance company as long as they don't insult me and refuse to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could it be that it's the opposite of loyalty that keeps people away from Kaiser? The reputation... Uh, 
being a socialist organization or an assembly line medical care. It's kind of the opposite of people that join Kaiser generation after generation. The others that maybe have a different idea in their mind that what Kaiser is, they don't gravitate. Well, it's true. You know, I remember the VP for HR, Hewlett Packard, saying to me once, Kaiser it polarizes people. There are some people that absolutely love it and just aren't satisfied if they don't have it, and there are other people who wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Um, there are, and there are people in the middle, okay? I mean, there are people, as Alan would point out, there's a lot of people, particularly working small employers, that don't have the choice to join Kaiser because their employer doesn't contract. They have a single, uh, and there's people that, you know, that, that they switch back and forth. You know, there's people that, um, uh, you know, every time there's a big contractual dispute between Sutter Hospitals and Blue Cross, another thousand people say, I'm sick of this, and they just move over to Kaiser. You know, it happens every, every single time. Um, and so it's not, I mean, and there's like the, I guess I would put it, there's a third of Californians that love it and, you know, whatever. A third of Californians, you'd hate it, you wouldn't get them in there. And a third, you know, what's the price? You know, Kaiser sees it. You raise that premium, 10 bucks, boom, a whole bunch of people leave. You reduce that premium, suddenly they're flooded. Um, you know, people are like, uh, so many people are so unloyal here. I've had discussions with professors here at Berkeley, and this is a, this is a true story, saying about how, you know, I, had to f I was forced to change my insurance plan, uh, and now the new one doesn't cover this drug that's really important to me. And why did, were you forced to change this? Well, because the premium was $10 more than the other insurance plan. And okay, okay. Then, then the conversation kind of rolls to their summer plans for Italy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You just kind of go, all yeah. right, you know, whatever. <laughs> Am I supposed to be feel sorry for you? You know, you can't get your drug. You know, pay for it out of pocket. I don't care. Uh, yes. The, the Kaiser DNA aside, in talking with a leader one time about um, Kaiser's success, he said that the operational model, which is to say the contractual model between the PMGs and the health plan, is really what is critical and is really the only way for uh, something like Kaiser to work. And perhaps it's the operational management model that is not understood outside of Kaiser so much as it's not the DNA model that's understood outside of Kaiser. Well, I can take a whack at that. I mean, um, there's, we're talking about organizational failure types. Well, another organizational type that has failed is the so-called staff model HMO. Now, the difference between a staff model and a group model like Kaiser is the staff model the doctors are actually employees of the insurance company. And, and many of the big insurers uh, tried to become wannabe Kaisers, and they said, uh-oh, we, we want to have our own doctors that are dedicated, and so, well, let's go hire them. And so, um, like Cigna. Cigna bought, bought up the Ross Luce plan in L.A., Cigna staff model, hundreds of doctors, et cetera. They employed doctors. Aetna, Blue Cross, Highmark, Humana, all had big, big, big staff models, and they all divested them. They all got out of that business. Why? lost money. That's why they got out of the business, of course. Why did they lose money? Well, the doctors, you know, you, you took these doctors out of private practice, fee-for-service, and you turn them into employees, and they immediately, you know, whoops, it's 5 o'clock. I have time to go home, you know, and uh, medical care quality demands that I spend 45 minutes with my patient, you know, and, whereas before, when they owned their own practices, oh, man, you know, fee-for-service, the patient was in and out of there in, in 11 minutes. That worked just fine. And so, the, the, and then they hated the, their employer, you know what I mean? They, they, they just thought that, the, you know, I work for Cigna, I'm a Cigna doctor, that doesn't have any pride of, whereas at Permanente, no, you ask the doctors, at least a lot of them, they say, I don't work for Kaiser, you know, I'm, I work for Permanente. And that's a, that's a big deal for them, you know. And they call uh, themselves shareholders. And they say this is a physician-run organization, which to a considerable degree it is. We try to mimic that at Berkeley. You know, the faculty thinks that they belong to the Academic Senate and that this is actually a group model uh, university <laughs> rather than a staff model. Well, but the problem is that just it's really a staff model. You know, we're just peons. You know, they, they, uh, <laughs> they tell us what to do and, you know, where to go and where's our office. And Just one more question. Alan would like to have an answer to a sort of broad national question. Um, he wants to know, um, in the Obama plan or any other national plans we can talk about right now, what would be the implications for Medicare Advantage? You mean what are the implications for Medicare Advantage of, first, first of all, 
Obama doesn't have a plan. In fact, mm -hmm. he just handed the whole thing back to the Congress and said, you figure it out. I want to see everybody covered, and I want it to be affordable. And stuff. Okay. With respect to Medicare Advantage, as Jamie said, this is kind of this political football. You know, at one time the left yeah. loved Kaiser, and then uh, the Republicans start loving it, which I was worried about. And then they got, and then the Republicans start saying it's sort of like an infant industry, private sector involvement in Medicare. And then they did something that made no sense, and that is we have private fee-for-service plans in Medicare. And just to get this whole thing going, we're going to pay them about 13 or 14 percent more than the equivalent per capita cost uh, if they stayed with fee Medicare fee-for-service. Now, it's very understandable that the Democrats looking for money to are, are going to say, we want to take back that 14 percent. I'm sorry for what it does to my friends at Kaiser, but I never believed that, that was a good idea. I spent my years pleading for a level playing field. Don't, you know, no favors for Kaiser or anybody else. They're so capable they can win without favors. But unfortunately, they kind of got caught up in this thing. I don't think it was their idea, but they got caught up in it. Now they've, they're using that money. So, so I, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I think. What's going to come out of Obama and the Democratic Congress is more and more just tinkering, you know, turn a little screw here, turn a little thing there with Medicare without biting the bullet. I think biting the bullet would be along the lines, I believe anyway, would be to adopt what Senator Bro and Congressman Thomas, the Democrat and Republican, in the bipartisan commission for the reform of Medicare came up with about 19 99, which was, let's convert to what we called, or they called, a premium support model, where the government says to the beneficiaries, we're going to treat you just like a Berkeley professor, okay? We're going to give you this amount of money and give you a menu of choices and some help to figure it out and, uh, and, and then get these different alternatives com competing. But um, that doesn't look like it's happening. I mean, my friends are all feeling a little despair. We haven't gotten this idea across. It's ironic here in America, um, we'd think that's what, you know, you read the Tocqueville, and it's Americans like multiple competing approaches, diversity, pluralism, everybody do it their own way. Well, why don't we create the level playing field and do the American thing? The Dutch have done it. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody for coming, and I want to particularly want to thank our panelists for their contributions. And um, if you are interested in pursuing uh, finding out more about uh, this project, go to uh, bancroft.berkeley.edu/roho. Look under Special Projects, and you'll see Kaiser Permanente. You click on that, and then the interviews that are currently online, uh, which are actually more than you can read in a night, uh, <laughs> will be easily accessible. They are also downloadable. So thank you again.